Hello and welcome to Inside Healthcare. As of the 1st of October, the Minnesota Department of Health reports 864 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Minnesota schools pre-K through 12. And of those cases, 446 were staff and about half of those were also cases were students. And 509 Minnesota schools report at least one positive case since August 1st. Joining us now, we're very pleased to have with us the superintendent of the White Bear Lake Area Schools to talk about what you're doing here at the schools and and how are you, what are you doing to keep the staff, the teachers, and the, and the students, of course, all safe? So glad to have you with us. Yeah, thank you for having me. First of all, very briefly, why don't you just tell us, for those not familiar with the White Bear Area Lake Schools, um, how many schools, students, teachers, what, what, tell us about the school. Yeah, sure. We, uh, <coughs> we're a school district in, in the Northeast Metro, and we um, are comprised of about 10 different communities, part, uh, all or parts of 10 different communities got 16 different sites, um, about 9,000 students, pre-K through 12, wow. um, about 1,500 employees. Um, yep. So I can imagine this has been, a, you said you've been here a few years, a challenging mm -hmm. year with um, COVID-19, the pandemic still going. What are you doing at the schools currently? Um, I've heard different schools doing district learn, distant learning, some doing hybrid learning. What are you mm -hmm. doing? So we're in a hybrid model right now for K through 12. Um, and uh, hopefully we can avoid having to go into distance learning uh, as we go throughout the year. I know last spring um, we were, um, all school districts in Minnesota were in a distance learning model. And now though um, districts are able to make decisions based on more localized data. and so. If we're able to stay in hybrid, that would mean that our localized data would, would tell us that we can continue to do that. So, so that's our hope. Um, and perhaps even throughout the year, we could um, increase the amount of time that students are in school. That's our goal. I think that, that was a governor's goal when he laid out the, um, the guidance. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're, we're, we monitor our, our local case rate data. And um, again, hopefully at a minimum, we're able to stay in hybrid and perhaps even shift in learning and uh, in person at some point. And what does hybrid look like? Is it a couple days a week, three days a week? I mean, how right. does that so, technically yep, look? Yeah, generally, and it's pretty typical throughout the metro, um, you, students are in school a couple days a week and then at home the, the other three. Yep. So uh, how's that going so far? What are some of the things that are, have come up that you've maybe not had anticipated? Yeah, well, um, so we uh, we you know we had a practice run at it in the in the spring and then um, over the summer we got ready for for fall with hybrid and um, so what you know what did we not expect I, I I don't know that we are surprised anymore as things yeah. come up <laughs> um, you know I I, uh, I think we're doing a much better job now than with the with the distance portion of of the of the model and uh, the fact that we're able to have students in in school working with our our teachers and other staff is a real benefit, um, and so that that's been a real real positive with now compared to just a straight distance model. We were able to iron out um, technology issues, make sure families have what they need, um, provide professional development training for for staff so that they can deliver uh, on that uh, the the distance portion of the hybrid model. That's great. They're mm -hmm. able to do that technology. I'm, I'm hearing other parts of the country that. They um, don't even have Wi-Fi in areas, let alone um, computers available for students and things like that. Yeah, we're we're fortunate in the mm -hmm. certainly in the Twin Cities. I know there are parts of rural Minnesota that are that struggle a little bit more with uh, with with access, but uh, but generally we've been able to provide. A, if a family needs uh, help with Wi-Fi, we're able to get that help to them, and if they need help That's with great. devices, we're able to provide devices. So we've been able to to do that and if any, anybody needs help with that they just need to reach out and we'll, we'll help them out. I know uh, the good news that the Department of Health was saying that of the transmitted cases it happened outside of the schools here in Minnesota. So what are you doing to ensure that that stays that way for the White Bear Area Lake schools with teachers and, and, and um, students as well? Well, in a hybrid model, we're following um, we're following guidelines like um, social distancing or physical distancing. Um, we've limited the number of students in classrooms. They're wearing masks. We're uh, emphasizing hand washing, um, and so we're doing all the we're taking all those precautions that the Department of Health has laid out. Um, and and like I said, hopefully we can 
um, make it through the school year. And yep, yes, we'll have cases. We have had cases, but we, um, you know, we'll deal with those as we roll along. And um, as long as people remain flexible and remain, um, you know, continue to follow um, the guidance and the uh, that the Department of Health has laid out, we, we we're optimistic that we can get through the school year. How is it working out for um, for like breakfast or school lunches or even transportation? How sure. is that going? Yeah, um, well, transportation is going well. The the students have really um, followed the the, the rules you know, in terms of wearing masks, and so we haven't had a problem with students not doing that at all. They've been wonderful. Our, um, we've reduced capacities to about 50 percent of uh, on a bus, so um, students are able to spread out. Um, so the transportation seems to be going well. We have asked for parents to transport um, mm -hmm. more frequently than perhaps in the past. We've extended our walking um, distance to schools again to help uh, help reduce the number of students that we're we're transporting. But that's going well. Um, nutrition services is 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 up and running really well. We uh, thanks to a federal grant, so uh, students don't pay for breakfast or lunch. So that's, uh, that's quite a benefit. And then we also send meals home with, with students for those distance learning days. And, and so um, you know, we, we would encourage families to, if, if, they, if they need help with meals, uh, contact um, White Bear Lake schools. Or if someone from outside of the White Bear Lake district is watching, they contact their school district and, and ask for that help because there's, there's food available and it's, it's funded through, a, uh, through the federal government. So we that's would wonderful. encourage families to do that. Mm -hmm. That's really great. Um, as far as, um, it's hard to believe, the first semester is almost coming to a close already. It seemed like it's school just started. Yeah, well, we're uh, first quarter. You know, first quarter, we're, yeah. As we, you know, well, semester. nine week quarters, and so we're about, you know, we're half. For, for us, the way we're doing it, we actually are about, because um, we've condensed, it's secondary, we've condensed, so we only, we're offering. Um, students take three classes right now and so they're uh, we've condensed the schedule so that it actually in four and a half weeks they're covering a quarter's worth of work so semester will be mid-year so in, in January okay. our semester will, will anticipate any on. changes when you get into the next quarter the next semester um, no not at this point um, and I think that's key at this point because things do change I think that's been a constant is that things are changing rapidly and um, we're not necessarily surprised when something new comes up so could it look different in the, in the second semester? It could, but at this point, we're not anticipating that it would look different. You know, and finally, what lessons have you learned trying to educate our kids during a pandemic? A long time educator yourself. Yeah, um, I, I don't know if, uh, I mean, I've l learned a ton, but I, I think perhaps one of the most important things it's reiterated how important relationships are uh, between um, students and other students and students and the adults in our system. And, um, and I think that, uh, spring we learn and through the summer we learn the importance of of students being back with with other students and being with with adults and I, I have children of my own and I can tell you it was night and day once they were able to be back interacting yeah. with classmates and with teachers that made a huge difference on on their outlook and so um, so I, I that, that's something I knew um, but I think it's something that's just really been emphasized and and honestly, we, we just need to be we need to be empathetic and understanding and flexible and um, and resilient during these times. And so, um, with so much um, what seems like so much division about any and pick a topic these days, and there's a there's it seems like there's a division. And we um, you know we, we try to remain um, remain a place where kids can go where it's safe and where they they feel like uh, no matter no matter how they're feeling, they have a, a safe place to be and an, an adults who care about them. Well, it's really been a pleasure to have you on the show here. So I know you're very busy. So thank you for taking time out. Yeah, and thank you Hopefully much. we can have you back in, later in the year yeah, or I maybe next to. spring and see yeah, how I'd things are going back. then. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. thank you. Appreciate it. All right. We'll be back with more right after this. Son, love is like the ocean. You have to tread the oh, waters. Dad, that's not the kind of help I needed. Jessica? Will you go to prom with me? Yes. Thousands of teens in foster care can't wait to share their first with you. Welcome back to Inside Healthcare. The coronavirus and the future of healthcare are major issues of concern as voters go to the polls. We sat down recently with the Secretary of State, Steve Simon, as he met with virtually with high school students from around the state to answer their questions about voting this year. 
So hi everyone, thank you all for being here. And I'd like to welcome you all to our conversation with the Minnesota Secretary of State. This conversation is going to be surrounding voting and elections. I'm Paula Capo, and I'm a student at Math and Science Academy and I'm a League of Women Voters fellow. So I'd like to welcome the Secretary of State, Steve Simon, and I'd like to thank him for his time. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. As Secretary of State of Minnesota, I like to say that I'm in the democracy business, and what a time to be in the democracy business. At its best, our office serves to protect and preserve and defend and strengthen the right to vote. And my personal mission in this office is to make it as easy as possible for all eligible Minnesotans to vote. This year, it seems like there's something harder and more complicated at every turn. Uh, we've got a pandemic that has changed how we live. We've got mass civil unrest uh, in response to a lot of social injustices. And we have a lot of people that are just feeling frustrated and even fearful about what's next in our country, in our state, in our communities. The good news is that in Minnesota, we pay attention and we care. And most importantly, on a routine basis, we show up to make sure that our voices are heard. In fact, Minnesota has routinely been number one in the country for voter turnout. The last two elections in a row, we were national champs. And in 2018, that last time, we weren't just number one overall, we were number one among youth, ages 18 to 29. That's something to be proud of. Now, young folks like all of you, whether you're, it's your fellow League of Women Voters fellows or those of you affiliated with the Minnesota Youth Council, I bet that a lot of you know about some of the changes you'd like to see in the world. And you know that voting is a huge part of that. Now, one thing that a lot of people might not know is that the U.S. Constitution gives a lot of wiggle room and latitude for the states. They have the freedom to run elections, basically how they see fit. And each state has different laws about how voters can cast a ballot. And you may have seen this in action during our and other states' recent primaries. It's not totally the same from one state to another. Minnesota's elections law, I'm proud to say, have made it easier for all eligible Minnesotans to vote. We have things that many and most states don't. So we have what's called same day or election day voter registration. We have online voter registration. We have what's called no excuses absentee voting where you can vote from home absentee without having to give a reason of any kind. Just do it because you want to. Um, and of course, any person can vote in person at a polling place on election day. Now, I like to say that elections are really a season rather than just one discrete day in Minnesota. And in Minnesota, we have one of the longest election seasons of anywhere in the country. In fact, we're tied with South Dakota for the longest such absentee period or election season. In fact, Minnesota voters will be able to start voting for president, along with South Dakota, on September 18th, the earliest date in the country where all voters will get that privilege and that right. I just want to talk for a couple minutes about voting during a pandemic for a moment. None of us knew this would come, and none of us uh, necessarily months and months ago planned for this, but here we are, so we've had to plan. We are expecting about 3 million voters this year, and that's spread out about 3,000 polling places. So you do the math, that leaves a ratio of 1,000 to 1, roughly 1,000 voters for every polling place in Minnesota. Now, in the early days of the pandemic, you remember all the talk about flattening the curve? Well, this is an opportunity to flatten a different kind of curve. It's a curve we need to flatten from a public health standpoint. We wanna get those numbers down so that the polling places can be as safe as possible. Now, not everyone will want to or can vote from home this year. I totally understand that. And there are a lot of voters who are gonna to want to show up at a polling place. Regardless, no one in Minnesota or anywhere should have to choose between their health and their right to vote. And we need Minnesotans to step up and to become poll workers. Sometimes they're called election judges as well. It takes 30,000 people, 30,000 to be poll workers in order to put on a good and secure election in Minnesota. That's a lot of people. And as you may know, our usual standby trustee poll workers in Minnesota tend to skew a bit older. They tend disproportionately to be retirees or seniors, and they do a fantastic job but they are more susceptible and more vulnerable to COVID-19. And as a result, some number of them are choosing to take themselves out of the running this year. So we've got to replenish their ranks with people of all ages. Now, like the primary season in Minnesota, the polling places will be safe and clean. Uh, we have spent the time, effort, energy, and money to purchase and distribute to all 3,000 polling places high-quality masks, wipes, 
hand sanitizers, pumps, and we have a system uh, in place in terms of rules uh, which will govern everything from social distancing to the use of pens to the automatic wipe down of the polling surfaces after the use by each voter. Now, if you're interested in politics or in government and making a difference, please consider signing up to be a poll worker because we really need you this year. You only need to be 16 years old to do it, not 18. 16 is the age. And some counties in Minnesota are even paying up to $20 an hour. You even get paid for the two hours of training that you must take in order to do this job. It's a great way to see the political process from the front lines and to do a really important public service. Now, there's one more thing that you should do right now without delay. In fact, you can do it as I'm speaking to you right now. If you're going to be 18 by November 3rd, by the general election, pick up your phone and go to the website mnvotes.org. That's mnvotes.org. And when you go to mnvotes.org, you will find that you can check the status of your registration. You can actually register to vote on that site. You can order the absentee ballot to come to you where you live so you can vote from home this year. And once you voted from home, once you've popped it back in the mail and returned that ballot, you can actually track that ballot like you can an Amazon order or a package and know with certainty that it's arrived. It's a great feature that people really love. So look, 2020 requires all of us to adapt, to do things a little bit differently, and we're doing that. And I'm quite confident that given our pro-voter laws in Minnesota and our pro-voter culture, we're gonna have an election this year that is safe, that is secure, uh, that is fair, and that is clean. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any of your questions. I'll start off with the first question, and it's how can young people who are not of voting age get involved in the voting process? Yeah, great question. I think there are a couple things that come to mind. One is by standing up and stepping up and being a poll worker this year. Uh, we need 30,000 of them to run an election. You can do it as of age 16. Uh, it's a paid gig, a paid opportunity including even for the two hours of training you get paid as well. So that's one way that's directly involved with elections. Other than that, I think there are great opportunities with organizations like the League of Women Voters, like Minnesota Youth Council, to get out and talk about the need for others to vote, even though the person doing the talking might not be 18 yet, to talk about why to vote, why it's important, um, to use existing channels, including social media, to spread messages about the need to vote and information about where to vote as well, whether it's our website, mnvotes.org, or others. I think there are a lot of ways for young people to get involved. I'm a strong believer that if you believe in certain outcomes, you, have, you hold certain values, that you should follow those values to a candidate or a political party of your choice. So get involved as a volunteer for a political can candidate in a political campaign. Uh, my name is Haley, and I go to Coon Rapids High School. I was wondering if there was a place where everything on the ballot is listed depending on address and what the best way to get that information well known to miss most Minnesotans is. You go to mnvotes.org, we have a feature called My Ballot. And when you go to My Ballot, you simply type in your address and up, up pops basically your ballot, all the contests on the ballot. So if you're wondering, hey, are we voting for county commissioner in my area this year? Or is there a mayor's race? or is there a state legislative race? You can know, just type in your address and up pops all the contests with web links to the candidate's own websites. So it's a great tool, it's a great feature that's been very popular because there are a lot of contests sometimes on ballots and people aren't totally familiar maybe with all of them and it's a great way to find out what they are. Up next, Izzy. Hi, my name's Izzy and I go to Edina High School. And my question is, um, with recent developments with the USPS and COVID, um, what is your advice to voters on the best way to stay safe and make sure that their votes are being counted? Yeah, thanks. Uh, we've all seen the disturbing reports about uh, slowdowns at the USPS, whether intentional or not. Um, and I'm disturbed by those reports. That said, uh, there may be people trying to slow down the U.S. mail service. They are not going to slow down democracy in Minnesota or anywhere else. And we have to be resolved about that point. I am. Look, we've got some built-in safeguards there. Yes, it's possible that in November mail will be slower than it is now. But we've got to overcome that. Like, we are so many obstacles in the year 2020. So my advice to everyone is, yes, I still think you should strongly consider voting from home. It's still a safe and good and solid option. Uh, for a lot of reasons. It's comfortable, it's convenient. And if you're worried about USPS um, uh, rules, just send your ballot earlier. Order it early, order it now by going to mnvotes.org. Please don't wait until October. 
Don't do that, order it now, and then send it back as soon as you reasonably can. Hello, my name is Audrey and I go to Wyzetta High School. Um, I was wondering how you sign up to be a poll worker for the upcoming election. I think there are two ways. One is to go to our website, mnvotes.org, and you'll find an interest form there where you can, um, that's linked to various different counties. If you're 16 and 17, you have to be either a city within your county or in the next county over that touches your county. I know that's kind of a weird rule. Um, so if you're 16 and 17, you're not bound to your own city. So if you live in uh, Wyzetta, and you hear that they need people in Minnetonka or Minneapolis or anywhere else for that matter, you can go there as well. So I would either contact a city and they will be thrilled to get your call, I promise you, um, or you can go to mnvotes.org and fill out the interest form. Either way, we want to get you matched up as soon as possible with a place that needs folks, and then you can get that paid opportunity for November. I'm Caitlin from Grand Rapids High School. And I was wondering, what are some options for folks in rural communities and greater Minnesota who often rely on the USPS to vote in a time where many may feel it's less secure or accessible? I'm concerned about some of what we're reading and hearing and seeing about USPS. Fortunately, um, there is that one week buffer so that you can send it on Tuesday, November 3rd, as late as that and it's still going to be counted if it gets there within a week. But there's something else I haven't mentioned before, and that's this. Just because you get it sent to you by mail doesn't mean you need to return it by mail. For those who are really concerned, um, or for those who aren't concerned and just want to do it this way, you can hand deliver it to the place that's listed on the envelope or have someone you know and trust hand deliver it for you. So if you really just don't want to risk the U.S. mail, you want to vote from home because it's arguably a public service this year, right? Because every person that votes from home is making the polling place just a little bit safer for everyone who chooses that option. So you may really want to do it, but you're just a little nervous about the U.S. mail. I would say either give yourself more than a week. Don't send it on Election Day. Send it a day or several days earlier or go to whatever the envelope uh, address is on that envelope where you send your ballot back, hand deliver it, or give it to someone you trust to hand deliver it for you. So you don't have to use the mails at all to get to, or to return the ballot that you yourself received by mail. Hi, my name is Nora. I go to Washburn High School. Um, and my question is just, is there anything you are particularly concerned about in regards to the upcoming election? Regards to the election. Yeah, take your pick. I'm concerned about a lot of things. There's a lot of moving parts to putting on an election, of course. Um, and we think about them a lot, particularly in COVID-19. I would um, say that one thing, there are others, but one thing that just comes to mind that's really been weighing on us and that we're thinking about is that bit about the election judges, making sure that we fill all 30,000 slots. We really need to do that. It doesn't matter if two people show up at the polling place or two million. We still have to stand up 3,000 different polling places and make sure they're adequately staffed. And we've seen what happens in some other states where they're not adequately staffed where you had kind of a breakdown, where you had some upheaval, even chaos in the polling places. Um, and some of those examples were extreme examples that are unlikely to repeat in Minnesota, but the, the same principle is true. If you're supposed to have seven or eight election judges and only two show up for whatever reason, that's going to be a problem. And so we're spending a ton of time working with counties and cities, and they're the ones. Our office doesn't hire or train or pay the election judges. It's counties and cities that do that. But we're working with them to try to brainstorm best practices and best ideas so that they can fill those slots. And I'm really confident that we're going to be able to do that, but no question, it's something we think about a lot. That's, that's one of those pressure points, one of those places where, where, where things could definitely go wrong, especially at the last minute. So. We're, we're primed for that, we're, we think we're ready for that, um, and we're working on that problem every day. Hi, I'm Amelia and I go to the Northfield High School. Um, my question is, can you explain the process of registering to vote and requesting an absentee ballot? Is there a certain amount of time that you should wait after registering before requesting an absentee ballot? Well, to that last part, no, you can do them in one fell swoop, in one transaction. You can both um, seek to register and request that the absentee ballot come to you. You just go to mnvotes.org and it's all spelled out right there. But uh, in a nutshell, here's the process. To register in Minnesota, you really got to demonstrate or show two things. You are who you say you are and you live where you say you live. Those two things. 
And fortunately, Minnesota law is very forgiving and generous about the ways that you can do either of those things. You don't need a government issued photo ID, although that is what a large majority use, but you don't have to have that. If someone who's a registered voter in your precinct can vouch for you and swear under penalty of perjury uh, that you live where you say you live, um, that can meet the, uh, the standard for getting you registered to vote. Hi, my name is Sahitra and I attend ECU High School. Um, there's been a lot of talk about trying to get more and more people to vote, but a large percent of those people don't know much about the candidates. What are some ways to make people norm more knowledgeable about the candidates that are running? Yeah, well, in a year like this, where you've got a presidential election, that one is easy, right? Because we're all just flooded with content and everyone's got an opinion on the, on the presidency or on the candidates for president. But I think your point is, is, is very well taken as to so-called down-ballot races, things other than president, things even at the local level where some folks might not have an idea. So one starting point is our website, mnvotes.org, where you can go and you can go to the My Ballot feature, type in your address, and get a list of all the races, all the contests, and the candidates in those contests, complete with their website information if they have a website. But of course there you're only hearing about them in their own words, which of course is going to be the all-star list of everything great. And that's, that's good, I mean that, that's a starting place. But I would urge people to, for example, follow and go to sources like the League of Women Voters, which has been a consistent decades-long source of information about the candidates. They often host candidate forums. And I think people have found those very, very useful. Um, so a lot of people just don't feel motivated to vote because they're just not happy with the presidential candidates. So what would you say to people that don't really plan on voting or they're just conflicted because they don't really like their options? Well, I understand that impulse and that feeling of maybe feeling disappointed about who the choices are. Maybe you're not wild about any of them. But my strong advice is to pick the best one. You cannot reasonably expect um, everyone or anyone really on the ballot to agree with you 100% of the time. That's just not going to happen. And if we're all in search of the perfect candidate, we're going to be looking around and wandering in the wilderness for a long, long time. So pick the best one, especially, uh, well, I, should, I shouldn't say especially, for every office, no matter what the stakes, no matter how high, no matter what. Vote for the best one if you're confident you know something uh, about those candidates. If you're confident enough to vote in that contest, vote for the best one. So I understand um, that it's not always going to be a perfect candidate, but I think it's really, really important, given the stakes, particularly this year, particularly in a time of a pandemic, um, to put aside this idea that there will be the candidate that checks all of your boxes, the candidate that agrees with you on everything and think through who would be the best possible person among the various options for a particular office. That's the best I can say, because I think that's the real world of voting. Hard fights have been fought to preserve and protect the right to vote, and there are still people who are trying to suppress that right in our country today. In fact, there are new threats like that each day. So look, I, I can't put it any better than the words I saw a while ago on a t-shirt. They stick with me, I will not forget them, and the words on the t-shirt said this. The words said, failure to vote is not an act of rebellion, it's an act of surrender. I completely agree. You know, when you turn 18 in this country, you get a lot of things. Maybe a slice of birthday cake, a pat on the back, what have you. You know what else you get? Formal political power. If you're a citizen and you turn 18, you got formal political power, a right to have an impact on who governs you and how. Don't give it up, don't surrender it. If you leave that thing of value on the table, you know what's gonna happen? The same thing as would automatically happen when you leave anything of value on the table, someone's gonna come by and swipe it. So don't do it. Reflect on it, but don't do it. Use that right you've been given. So show up, stand up, step up, and be a voter this year and every year from now on. It's never been easier, and the stakes for all of us have never been higher. So once again, visit mnvotes.org for all your voting and registration needs. That's the place to take the first step. Thanks for your time and attention. I really appreciate it. Well, please remember to go out and exercise your right to vote. Well, that's our program for you. Thank you for joining us. We hope you can join us next time on Inside Healthcare. We'll see you then, everyone.